Vantex was founded back in 2007, and I remember back in my Newegg days uh, getting these massive air coolers that they initially launched. But it wasn't until around 2014 that I think uh, Fantex really broke out in the DIY PC market, and that was with the launch of their Enthu Pro case, which had a really nice range of features, cost about $100, and that's still available today, and it will continue to be available, even though what I'm building in now is the follow-up case, the Enthu Pro 2. I will be doing a build in this case today, so follow along and see how it goes. Excellent! Team Group's Dark Z series of DDR4 gaming memory features an aggressive yet stylish armored design with high performance aluminum alloy heat sinks to keep thermals in check. The Dark Z series uses specially selected high quality modules to achieve DDR4 speeds up to 3600 with XMP 2.0 support for easy setup, and kits are available in capacities of up to 32GB per DIMM, perfect for a gaming PC or a high end workstation. Click the sponsor link in the description for more, and if you're in the US, you can also check out their ongoing July giveaway, which you can still enter this week. So right out of the gate, this case is gonna cost you $130 for the standard version or $140 for the version with tempered glass that we're working with today. And it has some unique features like the ability to do a dual system configuration in here with some extra accessories available from Fantex, of course. And a huge amount of support for water cooling configurations or adding a bunch of drives if you're looking towards building something more in the server realm. That would actually go along nicely with the dual power supply setup capabilities. But more on that in just a second. The system I'm building in this case is gonna cost around $27 to $2,800 total. And although that is a high-end system with a steep price tag, we are featuring an RTX 2080 Ti, so that's a big chunk of that cost. And I am going with the Ryzen 3800 XT, which costs $400, but it is the fastest eight core 16 thread CPU on the 3000 series that AMD makes. That said, I will point out a few areas here where you could shave the price down pretty significantly, get it down towards the $2,000 range. Let me run through the rest of the parts real quick, and then we'll take a closer look at the case. So our CPU did not ship with a cooler because the 3800 XT being the fastest, they assume you're gonna go with an aftermarket cooler, which is a reasonable assumption, but something to keep in mind if you go with this. It is 400 bucks, and if you're looking for something less expensive, but you still want to maintain eight cores and 16 threads, the 3700X you should be able to find for $300 or even maybe 10 or $20 less than that. And that does ship with the cooler, so you could save another 150 or so by not going with an all-in-one like this. A big part of the reason I chose the all-in-one, which is the Castle 360 EX from uh, Deep Cool, part of the Gamer Storm series, which does have some pretty cool anti-leak technology going on. But I just wanted to use a full-size 360 millimeter radiator in the case. Part of our analysis of building in there is going to be installing something a little bit more complex than the stock cooler that would ship with the Ryzen processor. All that said, for the $550-ish combined price of both of these, I would not recommend that. I would recommend just going with a 3900X, which you can get for around 400 bucks now. That would give you a 12-core, 24-thread processor that would chip with the CPU cooler in it, and then you could maybe upgrade that down the line. Anyway, I just had to explain why I'm going with this configuration that is not necessarily one that I'd recommend people buy right out of the gate. Our motherboard, though, is going to be the MSI MAG X570 Tomahawk Wi-Fi. A uh, nice full-featured motherboard. This one will cost you around $220. Consider the uh, B550 version of this motherboard, which still has the USB 3.2 Gen 2 front panel connector that uh, this case does support. So that's part of the reason I went with this motherboard. I have the B550 version of this as well, but it's currently in a different build. Now, there is a power supply shortage right now, and they're all fairly overpriced and somewhat difficult to find. So that is why I am going with this, which is an SFX power supply which is very small for this case, but it's literally the only one that I had around that was kind of matched up with the rest of the specs of the build and wasn't currently in use. So this is 80 plus platinum. If you're shopping around for a power supply, I'd recommend a full-size ATX one because you don't want to overpay for uh, the smaller form factor like this when it's not really being used. But about 750 watts is a good wattage for a medium to higher end build where you might have more stuff going on and go for 80 plus gold or platinum if you can afford it. And then of course, fully modular is nice and make sure it's got all black cable. Our memory is going to be uh, 32 gigs of Team T-Force Nighthawk RGB, and uh, this I'm going with mainly because it's pretty. It's actually a really nice looking kit of memory. Uh, this speed is not actually what I'd recommend either. I have a 3600 speed kit linked in the video description, but, but it looks the same and it's the same to install, so uh, we'll stick with that. And then for an SSD, we have an M.2 NVMe. This is an Intel uh, 660p series, and this is a two terabyte version. I like the 660p because they're reasonably priced and it gets you a lot more of the speed that you can access with an NVMe drive compared to SATA. That said, it's not the fastest one overall, so if you're going for a high speed, consider a drive that does not use QLC memory like this one does. Of course, we need a graphics card, and I wanted to go with an RTX 2080 Ti just because it's the fastest one available, and I actually have quite a few of those available here.
here in my garage or around my house, but this is the only one that wasn't currently installed in a system. It's also the largest and craziest one, which is the MSI Lightning version. It's got a big old triple slot cooler and a LED display on the side that has Lucky the Dragon dancing around for you and stuff. It's, it's a really nice car, but it's also like about $1,600 if you can even find it for sale anywhere. So in the description, I have, I think an Asus model link that's uh, much more reasonably priced than this one and also possibly available for sale. Again, though, uh, a way to shave maybe five to $600 off of the overall cost of this build if you're looking to model something after it would be to go with an RTX 2080 or RTX 2080 Super, which you should be able to find for five to $700 less. And the last thing to mention is about the case here. And for $140, I think you're actually getting a decent amount of case here. It matches up pretty well with some of the other competitors, especially if you're comparing it to something like the Lian Li uh, 011 Dynamic XL. That said, I think part of the way that Fantex has kept the price down on this relatively is it doesn't ship with fans. So you gotta add your own fans. So maybe you like that because you have your own fans that you wanted to use, that you wanted to swap in, but it is an added cost potentially to the overall price of your build. So bear that in mind if you're using this case. I am going to sort of cheat by using these master fan, triple fan setups, which should greatly ease the installation process, especially for the RGB connection. So those are the parts we're working with today. And uh, I'm gonna get this case out of the box so we can take a first look. Today's video is just focusing on the build and the build process and quirks of that wherever they come up where I feel like it should be pointed out. But we actually also have the benefit of this case launching a few days ago, which means some reviews have already come out. That allows me to reference uh, some thermal testing that has been done on this. And I will uh, link the Gamers Nexus video in the description for this. It goes over a lot of the details of the case. Steve and crew over there did a great job on it. But two things to point out here. One is that mine came with accessories. So haha, -ha, Steve, uh, mine's, mine's better. Their sample for some reason did not ship with accessories. But the second thing is one of the uh, big selling features features of this case that Fantex is pointing out is this mesh fabric on the front. They're calling it high performance fabric. There is a dust filter that sits behind it as well, but uh, Steve and company did a bunch of different testing configurations and they found this case has very good airflow. Thermal performance for both the CPU and the GPU were right up there among some of the best cases that are out there on the market. So Fantex did a good job with the design of this case when it comes to airflow, uh, but it should be noted again, no fans are included. So when you're testing an air airflow and doing a cross comparison, uh, it's hard to say, well, here's testing out of the box thermals uh, and here's testing with one fan configuration and here's testing with another fan configuration. Long story short though, if you're looking for a case that has good airflow and you're planning on really kitting it out with a lot of hardware, even the potential, like I said, for a dual system setup, uh, it does seem like the Enthu Pro 2 has the chops for it. Our tempered glass panel though is nice, thick and sturdy. It's reinforced with some metal strips on either side where it actually hooks and latches into the case and it has some capped thumb screws on this side that you undo and then it kind of pops out a little bit and you lift it off. It does not have the hinge at the back like some of the other Fantex cases, but it does provide a pretty clear, open and un unobstructed view of the inside of the case. So there's the Pro 2 with the side panel off. Here's a quick look at accessories. Uh, you get a booklet that uh, goes over the ins and outs. You have a little plastic container with all of your screws and mounting hardware and everything. And this is one of the things with the original M2 Pro that Fantex started including, which was just one of the things that made it a little extra and a little special and a little like, oh, they didn't just chuck everything in a bag. I have quite a few of these around and, and they always come in handy because I'm always like, I need an extra screw. Maybe there's one in metal Fantex container. Beyond that though, uh, we have some expansion slot covers and zip ties. We have a mount for a vertical GPU configuration. And since there are two places in the case you can mount a system, this is actually a mini ITX motherboard right there. So you can mount it vertically and then you can use this bracket at the back of the case for your IO. And then you'd either need to not use a graphics card with that system or you'd have to buy the ribbon cable. So it doesn't come with ribbon cables. It is ready for vertical GPU mounts, but does not include the ribbon cables. This mount could go down there to mount the graphics card and then the IO for that would be back there. You also have uh, vertical GPU mounts over here for the upper full size ATX system. System, uh, but again, you would need the ribbon cable add-on accessory for that. This is a GPU anti-sag bracket that goes along the PCIe expansion slots over on that side. We will be putting it to the ultimate test with the Lightning RTX 2080 Ti. And then you've got these drive cages, uh, which are actually pretty nice because they're all metal and they have the capability of slotting into areas so they, they kind of stick out. 
You get four included with the accessories and you have the ability to stack some of these back here if you want and you have the ability to stack these all up here if you want. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can kit this uh, case out with a bunch of storage, whether you're talking about 3.5 inch drives or these do also have 2.5 inch mounts on them, although that's not the most efficient. Uh, for that, you should use these covers. These are plastic, pre-included, uh, pre-installed, pre you get four of them there. Each can mount two 2.5 inch drives, one to this side and then one that snaps in on this side. The channels on the back here are supposed to be for routing cables through them after you've popped a drive in there, I suppose, or probably before you pop a drive in there. So I don't know, maybe you find those useful, maybe you don't. So up here is gonna be your mounting area for your main system or your main uh, motherboard, which would be a full size ATX. It also uh, can expand to support SSI EEB size motherboard. So it does have greater width there. Although if you went with a wider motherboard, you would block some of these pass through grommets. Now the power supply is gonna mount on the other side of this panel right there and it mounts vertically. So over here you have a grill and that'll be for the intake for your power supply and the uh, AC power cord to be over there. This panel can be removed and that will allow you to install two power supplies, which you might think, oh, that'd be convenient if I did a dual system setup. However, the dual system setup is right here. So you have the choice. You can do two power supplies and one system, or you can do two systems and one power supply. Fantex makes a power supply called the Revolt X that can power two systems at the same time. So they're pretty much assuming you're gonna need to use that if you're gonna go with that configuration. Alternatively, if you were going with more of like a server setup or something that would require some redundancy. For a dual power supply setup though, they have a power supply called the Revolt Pro that has a capability of linking to another power supply to either provide more power or provide uh, redundancy in case of one of the power supplies failing. So if you were setting up something akin to a server in here or something that you did re need redundancy for, you might find that useful. All that said, if you don't install a second system here and you don't install a second power supply here, you can use this area down here for fan intakes or for mounting a radiator and if you can imagine you can get pretty thick with a dual fan or a push-pull configuration and a pretty fat radiator down there at the bottom. This supports a 360 or three 120 millimeter fans. This mount here can also support a 140 millimeter fan. In the top, because there's actually not very much vertical clearance above the motherboard, which is kind of odd in a case this big, but uh, so it goes. But you can use this for fan mounts, so you can do three 120s or three 140s in the top. If you remove all these SSD mounts, there's a pass-through right here, so a similar configuration to like the Lian Li 011 Dynamic, and you can do up to 420 millimeter fans there, or a 480 millimeter radiator. And then for the front up here, which does have that uh, the high-performance fabric, and then a dust filter behind it, you can do four 120s or three 140s. And if you just want a quick at-a-glance look at the fan uh, support for this case, there it is. Here's the page for radiator support as well. They are saying that you can do up to a 360 millimeter in the top, but you would be limited on motherboard component height to 55 millimeters. So I feel like the top is gonna be more suited for just fans up there. On the side, you can go all the way up to a 480 millimeter radiator with a 32 millimeter width. On the front, you can go up to 480 if you're using 120 millimeter fans or 420 if you go three by uh, 140. And then of course you have the option to add rads to that rear exhaust if you want as well at 120 or 140. 40 and then uh, up to 360 in the bottom. Here's the opposite side panel. So I just wanted to take a look at all of the dust filters included in this case. There's a decent amount of just little magnetic ones that are held on with, with magnets. So you can filter some dust out. You got one there for the power supply, one here for the potential side intake for radiators or fans going on right here. Front panel pops off pretty easily by gripping the bottom. This is a plastic panel, uh, although it does have sort of a brushed finish that uh, helps it to blend in with, I would say the nice finish that's on the case as well. And this is that fabric mesh which uh, is, it, there's, there's decent gaps here. So you can tell why it still has good airflow, but you can also potentially see how this would also probably let more dust in. So it seems to be the ongoing battle with PC building is like, how do you find the perfect balance between something that keeps dust out, lets air in, and also maybe even block some noise, but uh, you can use this by itself if you want. Then you've also got this front supplemental dust filter, which has a finer mesh, so that's gonna keep more dust out, but that will impede airflow somewhat. Fantex actually provided airflow numbers for with and without this mesh, so they're acknowledging that some people might remove this if you want better internal temperatures. That's just gonna mean that you're gonna have dust build up a little bit faster. Personally though, I would probably leave that on. That's just me. 
Let me know in the comments what you would do. There is also a dust filter up on the top, same magnetic style one up here next to the power button. You can see the mounts up there for uh, 140 or 120 millimeter fans. And then down at the bottom, you have a uh, dust filter here that goes the entire length of the case, uh, which I find to be convenient. There is one little thing here though. This is gonna be a great dust filter if you actually kit out the bottom here with intake fans pulling air in. But if you have a power supply mounted right here, that power supply's fan is probably either gonna be up against this panel or up against the uh, glass of the case. So airflow might be a consideration there. And of course, I don't know of any power supplies that mount vertically and have the fan on this on the side there. So this uh, dust filter isn't gonna be helping that out. Down here at the bottom of the front of the case, you have a pass through here for a drain port. So if you are doing a custom water cooled loop in this case, that would be convenient. And then here's the rear panel cable management area where you can see Fantex has a bunch of uh, looped Velcro straps here for gathering the bulk of your cables and going down here. This is just a cable cover. So it's held on with a couple thumb screws. This is a metal piece as well, and it seems to be purely for aesthetics, or I guess if you really do have a grip of cables down here, it can help to sort of wedge them in there. Although you would then have to pass them through these pass-through areas on the side and on, on the top. That said though, another Velcro strap down there, and then uh, pretty often you have scattered around other tie-down points. There are three additional 2.5 inch drive mount brackets here as well. And these just pop on and off like that. And I think the last thing to point out here before I start building is gonna be our front panel I.O. All four of these are type A USB 3.0 ports. Uh, I'm glad that Fantex didn't remove some of these because much as I enjoy having this, and I, I do really appreciate having that, this is a USB type C port, a 3.2 Gen 2 capable one. I hate it when they add this and then decide, oh, we can get rid of the type A ports. So glad to have those there as well. This is an integrated uh, RGB LED control, supports digital RGB LEDs. There's a range of uh, default effects that you can control with these buttons up here, or you can of course still connect up to your motherboard and use software control. And then there's a combo port for mic and headphone. I don't like front panel mic and headphone jacks in general, and I think I would like them even less when it's a combo port. You would either need a headset that had the single jack or you need to use a splitter off of that. That said, uh, just, just don't use front panel audio. Plug into the back or use an external deck. So that's my once over for the case. First impressions are, I think uh, Fantex has made some interesting decisions to sort of provide a lot of flexibility for a case. It's a little bit bigger. There's lots of room to work with in here. It honestly seems a little bit overkill if you're just building a standard setup, like a pretty straightforward ATX system. But if you wanted to go beyond that uh, into water cooling, into something that requires power supply redundancy, or even the dual system setup provided you're willing to invest in the Fantex Revolt X power supply, it seems like there's a lot that this case could do that other cases could not. That said, I am not gonna build in it, and we'll see if that changes my opinion at all. Uh, not gonna focus on the build assembly too much. Uh, we'll come back to you in a minute after I get the motherboard set up and everything. Here's a change to the original parts. Uh, I was working with that uh, SFX Corsair power supply and I discovered SFX power supplies, well, I already knew this, but SFX power supplies are designed for many ITX cases typically. So the cable length is very short and I don't really have any extensions on hand right now to use. So I pulled this out of an existing system because that's that's the situation with power supplies right now, but this is the uh, Cooler Master MWE 1300 watt, which is actually a bit more in line with the power supply that I think goes along with the system. So that's what we're working with, and now you know. Just routing some cables here, and cable management is always one of those love-hate things with a PC build, but I like what Fantex has done here with their uh, pre-installed straps. They have a little hook here, so you can actually just unhook the whole strap in order to route your cables back behind there, then hook it back on, and then cinch it tight. So it's fairly easy to access. It's also not too difficult to undo and unhook if you need to route some more cables through there. So a pretty good system. The flip side to that, and something I would be a little bit more critical of is gonna be this uh, cable cover 
panel here that flips up. For one thing, it's actually riveted on down at the bottom, and I don't know if there is a reasonable way to remove it, but if there is, I can't figure it out just with some tweaking here. You're gonna end up with a pretty massive jumble of cables down there, and the idea is that you close this up and it secures them all, but you have to pass everything through the little gaps, so getting that to cinch down is just gonna be a little tough. And this is all gonna be covered by the side panel anyway, so I, I just kinda wish that Fantex had given you some method to remove this panel if you wanted to go without it. Wait, hold on, I spoke too soon. Uh, these little hinges right here can be removed or you can slide it off. So just uh, slide it to the left if you want to do that and remove this cover. Uh, it's actually not too terribly difficult, so that's good. Uh, I was about to give up on that and then receive some divine inspiration. I did persevere though, and I did manage to get this remounted, so I hope I don't have to pull that off anymore. Just been installing these Master Fan SF360R ARGB units, which are three fans, all in one unit, which is very helpful for wiring up the RGB as well as plugging the fans in. But this gives you a little bit of a better idea of how much clearance there is at the top of the case with just a 120 millimeter fan mounted, or three of them in this case. Because the 120 mounts are actually a little bit offset towards the tempered glass side panel, there is a reasonable amount of clearance here. I'm using taller memory sticks though, so just keep that in mind. You can go with taller dims if you're just planning on installing uh, fans to the top. If you are planning on putting a 240 or 360 millimeter radiator up here though, there is clearance. Just make sure you go with shorter dims and make sure that the power delivery setup, your cooling for that, uh, doesn't go beyond 55 millimeters and you should be good to go. I did have to make the call as to where to position the fans and where to position the radiators. So I went with uh, three fans in the front for intake, three fans at the top for exhaust. And then I'm gonna be removing these uh, 2.5 inch mounts for SSDs. And that gives you access to another area to mount a 360 or up to 480 millimeter radiator. Uh, I've got a 360 with our deep cool Castle 360EX. So aiming for right about there. And we do still have enough tubing length to get our uh, pump block units over to the CPU. So here's how the anti-sag bracket works. It actually mounts from the opposite side of the motherboard and you can see sort of the nubs of the graphics card sticking through here, hopefully you can. Now if you lift up on the saggy end of the graphics card, you can kind of see those nubs shift down a little bit. So if you can hold these down, it might help you out with your sag, possibly eliminating it. So they have provided you with this little bracket, slots in right there, and then uh, that mounts with some screws from the bracket. So you're gonna shift this up to hold those in place. I'm sorry, you're gonna shift this down to hold those in place wherever you want them and then there's a little bit of uh, give on the back and then you just tighten down the screws to hold it in place. Popping the front panel back on and I think this rig is all put together. So we have uh, power connected back here as well. What do you know? It powered on and the fans are spinning. We even have some RGB lights uh, scattered throughout, which is uh, nice because RGB lighting is often a real pain in the butt to set up. And uh, thanks, I'd say in particular, to those triple fan configuration setups that we have from Cooler Master, that made it a lot simple. Those units have their pros and cons, by the way, and I did do a video more specifically on them if you guys wanna check it out. But if you set up a lot of systems and if it makes you wanna tear your eyes out or your hair or whatever parts of your face out, uh, connecting up all those RGB lights, that really does simplify it. And so with our build put together, uh, we, can, we can sort of recap things. What was good, what was bad, what sucked? I wouldn't say anything necessarily sucked about the build in this case. Uh, it was all pretty much straightforward. There is some interesting configurations down here when it comes to the extra space they have for the potential second system or whatever else you might wanna do with this lower area down here. The most frustrating thing was that our uh, Deepcool uh, 360EX uh, actually shipped with the wrong screws for mounting it from the backside, so that was a little bit of a pain, but once we figured 
it out, it was okay. On the plus side, I would say this case has a massive amount of different configurations you can put it in, as well as a massive amount of different locations for mounting fans. Flexibility is always welcome because it means you can take the same case and you can configure it for a pretty wide variety of different systems. That said, this is definitely a full-size case, uh, mid-tower, probably I would describe it as a full tower. And if you're looking at this bottom area down here, it just looks a little empty. Granted, I could have gotten a few more fans and kitted it out down there, but that would just be adding fans to an otherwise empty space. And I really feel like this space should be used for something. So, so I guess that's the most odd thing to me about the configuration of this case is I really saw the original Fantex N2 Pro as sort of their consummate mid-range affordable bang for the buck case which is made for a single mid-tower computer build in it. Whereas this system is bigger and has a lot more support for a bunch of different configurations for stuff down at the bottom and uh, it's continuing Fantex's uh, seeming obsession with fitting two systems in one computer. And that does make some sense because Fantex sells the Revolt series of power supplies which do slot into here very nicely and give you the capability of running two systems off of the same PSU. However, it does make it more niche and a little bit more specialized. So whereas with the original N2 Pro, I'd recommend it pretty frequently. My only real issue at the time was with build quality and it could rattle from time to time, but you could get rid of that by adding some rubber or some sound dampening. The N2 Pro 2, I would say, I would only recommend if someone is uh, considering building a much more specialty system, something that requires dual power supplies for redundancy, something that really benefits fits from having two systems in the same case, which I think there's limited use case scenario for. Or of course, those more advanced builds where you're really kidding everything out with storage everywhere, or you're going for a very high-end custom open loop water-cooled build, which I will say, this has lots of room for. So if you are going custom water cooling, or if you have a use case for some of the specific stuff that this case is capable of, and especially if you've already got your fans picked out and uh, you know you're not gonna use whatever integrated fans come with a case that might cost 180 or $200, then this seems like it's right up your alley. I guess you could also contend that this might be like an upgrade path computer, you know, get your gaming rig set up for right now and play with it for a while and then have the potential to build like a dedicated streaming system in the bottom somewhere down the line. But let me know what you guys would do with this case if you think you'd go the dual system route or if you'd think you'd just kit everything out for uh, high and custom water cooling. One of the standout features for me after putting the system together, and especially since we're using this really bulky uh, MSI RTX 2080 Ti Lightning graphics card, was that uh, GPU support bracket. It hasn't completely eliminated the sag, but it's definitely helped with it a lot. This was a really saggy card before, and in fact, it shifts with a bracket that I left out so we could see how well the uh, Fantex N2 Pro 2's support bracket is. And I will say in this kind of worst case scenario, it's, it's doing a pretty good job. But that is gonna wrap it up for this video, you guys. Let me know what you think of this build, the parts I have chosen, what you think of the, the final finished look, uh, getting the tempered glass back on and everything, and of course, that sweet, sweet peel. Gotta include the peel every single time. If you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button on your way out, and don't forget to stop by my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, all sorts of excellent merchandise to help support my channel and also get you something with the thumbscrew logo on it. Thanks again for watching this one, guys. We'll see you next time. <laughs>